You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. Etienne Kret here, Forex trader and founder of Desire to Trade. Welcome to episode 77 of the Desire to Trade podcast. To give you some background, a couple of months ago, I was traveling in Ottawa, Canada, and I came across a bookstore and decided to go in and see what trading book they had, just for fun. And I came across a book, a book that really made a big difference for me, that really helped me. The thing about this book is it's really different from everything you'll see. It's not about technical analysis. It's not about psychology. It's about kind of everything you need to succeed in trading. It's called The Universal Principle of Successful Trading. It's by Brent Penfold. After reading the book, I decided to reach out to Brent for an interview, and he accepted gladly. In this interview, we talked about the things you need to know if you want to succeed in trading. And you'll see that Brent has a really interesting perspective on really what it takes to succeed in trading. And I especially like his advice on trading psychology. So this interview is going to be really valuable if you haven't gotten results in trading and if you have not put in the work you need. It's probably going to be motivational too because you'll have to put in some work. So help me welcome Brent Penfold. Brent Penfold, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, well, um, very well, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me on. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. and. I've had a lot of comments about what you're doing, and I've been through your, your books a couple of times myself. I'm super excited mm-hmm. to have you today on the podcast, for sure. Mm-hmm. And we'd like to start with one quote that the guests like. Or So what would be one quote that inspires you? One quote. One quote. Um, you know, probably the quote that inspires me, probably, you know, wouldn't really inspire, inspire many people, but really... You know, the, the quote that I live by is essentially, um, the best loser is the long-term winner. Love Understand that, that, embrace that, and you'll be a long way down the, the road to being successful. Oh, that's yeah, it's, that's... All, it's all about being a good loser because the winners just look after themselves and they're painless. All of the uh, financial and emotional energy is taken up by the losses. So be a good loser. That's right. So what's going on these days in your life? Oh, you know, if somebody asked me, you know, what I did all day without telling them what I, you know, specifically do, people would think I, I was a programmer because, you know, I'm, I'm probably finished by nine o'clock every morning by the time I've collected all my Asian markets and European and North American markets and run my models and place my orders and uh, produce my newsletters. Yeah, you know, I'm finished by 9 a.m. And so my day is essentially filled up with just research. And, and for me, that really means just a lot of coding. You know, the, the ideas come from left of field, wherever. And then I just spend a lot of my time just tapping away on the keyboard, coding up ideas, and, and really just trying to improve my mouse traps. That's pretty cool. Pretty nice, eh? <laughs> nice. Yeah. So I want to start by asking you, how did you get in trading in the first place? Because sometimes people want to know the story behind why you're at your point right now. And you're talking about that in your book, right? You had to go through probably the hardest time for, to, to become a trader. So how was that exactly? Oh, sure. Well, I, I was, I suppose, lucky. I didn't, didn't specifically set out to um, become a trader. Um, I was given advice that I, I should try and get some work experience in, in banking. And so when I was at university, I just wrote off to a whole bunch of merchant banks in Sydney and asked if I could get some work experience. And it, back in 1983, Bank America offered me a, a three-month work experience between my third and fourth year of uh, university, which I accepted. And essentially, I, I didn't leave. And you know, I was 21, and I did three months in, in treasury money market, foreign exchange. And like any young person, you do become very impressionable. And, and um, you know, just the atmosphere, the, the trading room and the amount of money that was going through and the amount of money was, that was being uh, made just um, hooked me. And so that, that's how I got started. I just got, was given an opportunity to do some work experience and I stayed. Nice, nice. 
And how did you transition from this to then becoming an author and I guess helping people as well? Oh, um, well, according to John Wiley, I was very unusual because they approached me to write a book based on our local index market that's called the SPY, the Share Price Index. That's our index futures contract that covers our Australian share market. Because apparently most people approach publishers to have books done. They actually sought me out and asked me to write a book. And I thought, well, why not? So, you know, I just wrote my first book called Trading the Spy, which is only, um, you know, published here in Australia. And I suppose that's how it started. And then I did my Universal Principles of Successful Trading, which really was off, off the back of my first book. Yeah, so I think I was lucky that they approached me. Interesting. So I want to jump a little bit into that. And I would say one of the lessons that I got from your, from your book was kind of, you know, when you start to trade, you kind of have this idea of looking for systems, right, and ways to trade. And then at one mm. point, you kind of learned that trading is all about psychology or like this is what you hear. And mm. when I read your book for the first time, I kind of realized that trading was not only psychology, which kind of brought me back to the right track. Can you talk about that a little mm. bit? Because it's really, really interesting, I think. That's a great question because it comes down to the core truth about trading. And unfortunately, you know, we get attracted or motivated to trade for all the wrong reasons, but also the right reason. You know, we get attracted to trading because we want to make money. But unfortunately, it takes a lot of false starts. It takes a lot of wrong directions to realize that where we place a lot of our focus isn't necessarily the, the, the correct area to focus in terms of turning ourselves into successful traders. And to me, it, it comes down to the, the truth about trading because the way that we get interested in trading to make money, you know, to look for entry signals and exit signals, what we find is that those initial interests that occupy us have very little value to ensuring that, that we survive long enough to enjoy those wins. And so it takes a long, long time to realize that profitable trading is not about picking winners. You know, it's not about forecasting tops and bottoms. It's not about finding a magic indicator. It's got nothing to do with, you know, having a, a perfect entry technique. And it's got nothing to do about whether or not you and I individually are the smartest trader. It's not about being you know, right about the market. And it's definitely not knowing about any trading secrets. It takes a long, long time for, for us traders to realize that really the truth about trading is that it's all about two things. In my mind, if you want to be successful in trading, if you want to know what the core truth about trading is and where you should focus your energy, in, in, energy into, there's, there's two very important points. One is you have to know the math. You have to know the mathematics of trading. That's number one. And number two, as I said before, you have to be the best loser. You have to welcome your losses. You have to endure the pain of losing. It's just part of trading. You can't sidestep it. You can't ignore it. You can't make it vanish. You just got to endure it. So there's two key points. One, understand the math. Number two, you just have to be a good loser. Believe me, just take your losses. They can depress you. They can hurt you. But they're part and parcel of the game. Now, that's probably the easiest of the two points to discuss. The first point is you've got to understand the math of trading. And it all comes down to a key concept called risk of ruin. And nobody should be placing an order on any market on their trading account unless their percentage risk of ruin is at 0%. And everyone, everyone who does trade has a statistical probability of ruining their account, which is based on how they approach the market and what percentage of their risk capital that they put behind each trade. And that comes down to two core ideas of trading, which is expectancy, which is a function of how we approach the market, methodology, and then money management. So when you combine your expectancy with your money management, that will produce a statistical risk of ruin. And that's the math behind trading. So just and, to give an example, I'm supposing mm. someone is going to risk like 100% of his account, so be all in, it's going to have a risk of ruin of one, right? Or 100%, is that right? 100%, yes. Yeah. That's correct. And, and really, if you're going to do that, you know, you're going to go bust. 
And I think once people understand that the trading is just really a, n- a numbers game, and there's that, that key pillar behind what we do, which is the mass, which is ensuring that we trade with a 0% risk of ruin. And then if, once people realize that even a 1% or 2 or 3% risk of ruin is too high, okay, because certainly somebody with a 1% risk of ruin will take longer to ruin their account than somebody who's trading, say, with a 30 or a 40% risk of ruin, right? But the fact is, regardless of what your risk of ruin is, as long as it's above you know, 0%, it's a guarantee that you will go bust, right? Mm-hmm. Guarantee. It's just a matter of when. Somebody with a 30% risk of ruin will go broke before a person with, say, a 5% risk of ruin. And a person with a 5% risk of ruin will go broke faster than a person with a 1% risk of ruin. And people aren't stupid once they have the knowledge. And once they realize that, they will put their tools down, their pens down, they'll take their fingers off their keyboards, and they won't trade until they get their risk of ruin down to 0%. And once you understand that as being the central pillar or core truth of trading, then I think for a lot of people, the light bulbs come on and they work out, oh my God, you know. Some people may have a, a very good strategy with very good positive expectancy that hasn't been curfeited. But where they're being let down is their money management side. They're risking too much of their, their money, which is causing their risk of ruin to be above zero percent. Mm-hmm. Alternatively, some people may be very conservative and risk a very, very small percentage of their risk capital. So the money management is quite good. But where they're let down is their expectancy, that the way they want to approach the market does not have a statistical positive you know, result to it because they're you know, probably trading by, by the seat of their pants. And once people understand the core components of this math, I think suddenly they're going to be in a much better, better place and a, a far more knowledgeable place to – you know, work out what they have to do to go forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you could have the perfect trading strategy, but if you risk too much and if you lose like 10 trades in a row, there's no yep. way, like it's possible to blow up your account. So Exactly. And alternatively, you have the best money management, but if the way that you want to trade has a, has a negative expectancy, same result. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the principle of maximum adversity? Because this is something people don't get, I think. But it's something that I found every single time I was trying something new in the market. Oh, it, it is. Maximum adversity is this idea that I'm not a pessimistic person, I'm an optimistic person. But when you come into the business of trading, you've got to become, I believe, a, a pessimist and believe everything is against you. And essentially, you know, it is. It is. It is. You know, you'll find more times than not, you'll be buying the top of the market and you'll be selling the bottom of the market and you'll think it's just you. Believe me, it's not just you. I do it all the time. And it's this idea that the have got to believe that the market is going to make it as hard as it can to take the money from the weak hands and move it across to um, the people who have the sort of the strong hands, so to speak. And once you believe or understand that the market will do what it has to do to disappoint the majority of people, then it's going to make you more conservative in how you approach the market. It's going to make you prepared to endure a lot of pain and not sidetrack you, sidetrack you from your goals. So it's, it's really a key idea because we, we, can't, we do come into training full of optimism and, and you know, we're already spending all the money we're going to make, right? Mm-hmm. And believe me, you know, this life is a whole bunch of speed bumps, potholes, blind corners, and in the marketplace, it's an idea that I, I call maximum adversity or Mr. A maximum adversity because you have to give him respect or give her respect <laughs> that the market will, will do everything in its power to disappoint you, myself, and anyone who wants to trade. And so you, have the, you really have to have this siege mentality to say it's going to be dangerous out there because, mm-hmm. you know, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? Yeah, totally. Obviously, it's not easy. So embrace and accept and be aware of this key idea of, of maximum adversity that just says, you know, the market will do what it have to do, do to disappoint the majority of people so the money gets moved from the weak hands, weak hands to the strong hands, okay? And we want to be the strong hands. And to do that, you just got to put your helmet on, buckle up your chin strap, and um, expect it to be, be nasty out there. And, and, and if you have that mindset, you will trade small. If you have that, have that mindset, you will ensure that you haven't curfitted your strategy to data, you know? If you have that mindset, you'll realize that 
you'll go for sim- simplicity in how you trade because if you have less variables in the way that you – how your methodology comes up with decisions, then you'll find that there's, there's less moving parts and there'll be less criticism or less chance that your strategy will fall into that terrible era, area of, um, of curve fitting. And, um, you know, respect maximum adversity. It'll put you in a good position. Mm-hmm. And you still debit your uh, trading journal whenever you place a trade as if it's going to be a losing trade? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. I think that's a, re- a great idea. You, have to, you have to do it. Take the loss. And it, that will help you become the best loser because your model will produce so many signals or you'll know what you're doing today. And you, you'll know how much money you're prepared to lose because you have good money management. And you know, I debit that before I place my order. So I can actually see the worst the market's going to do to me today. And once I take the market's power away from me, the, the power it has over me and the fear I have of losing, once I take that power away, away from the market, I feel like I'm, I'm trading for free, if that makes any sense. Because you know, what we all hate is the unknown. You know, what's going to happen today in the markets? What's going to happen tomorrow? You know, and it, it increases our anxiety levels and it can make us difficult to follow our plan. You know what? Why don't we assume, expect and assume the worst, take that money out of our account, have a look at it, or you're not happy, but you know what? You're not dead because you use sensible money management. You're still alive. Fantastic place to trade. Yep. And do you debit your account before every trade or is it like an amount you take off at the beginning of the day for the whole day? Oh, for the whole day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because I I basically trade um, over 30 markets multiple strategies and um, I have open positions and I have a portfolio approach. So it's just, you know, you just take it all off. So once we have a risk of ruin of zero, what's the next step after that? Well, after that, if you've got a 0% risk of ruin, that means you have a good methodology with a positive expectancy. So you have a, a clear way how you approach the markets to find your, which markets, you know, to trade according to your setups, your entries, and your stop levels, and it means that you're conservative on your money management. The next step after that is execution, 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 execution. And this comes into the field of psychology, where psychology is important because it's, it's the glue that keeps your expectancy and your money management together to ensure that you're trading with a, a 0% risk of ruin. And it's just basically... You know, ensuring that you follow your process each day. And when you find that you come to resent walking into your trading room and sitting down and collecting your data and looking for your setups and placing your trades and managing your open positions and moving stops, once you feel that, you're, that you have, re- have resentment to doing that because basically it's becoming boring, you know that you're in a good spot for trading because you're treating it like a business. So once you have a 0% risk of ruin, that means you've got your methodology your positive, positive expectancy, organized. It means that you are sensible with your money management. After that, it's all about executing, executing, follow your plan, follow your plan, execute, execute. Follow the process, repetition, and hopefully you will come to resent what you do each day because you're not trading for the excitement. You're trading to follow your plan, and hopefully you'll have a modest expectation which is not to be right or wrong each day, but to manage your risk capital with a, you know, a modest expectation. And that's when you're in a, a good spot. And, and in my opinion, you become a professional in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And so how do you deal with tough time then? Because there's always going to be times that are tougher than others, times where maybe you lose more than you should or... Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I come each day, you know, and in my mind, I just know that I'm, I always expect to lose. I always do my my PL spreadsheet, so I always know that you know how much I'm going to, you know, lose. Expect to lose if all my orders get triggered and I get stopped out. In addition, I always believe I'm about to enter my worst drawdown mm-hmm. because maximum adversity is going to tell you you will have a drawdown, <laughs> and your worst drawdown is always ahead of you. And so, I'm a, I'm a positive person when it comes to trading. What I find that helps me is you have to become a pessimist. You expect to lose, right? So therefore, you take the money out of your, your spreadsheet so that you can see what the loss is, make sure that you can you know, afford it, I suppose. And then you have to expect that every, every time, every period, like now, now, now is always a terrible time because you are about to you know, go into your worst drawdown. 
And all that does is it just really makes you, you know, respectful of what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I can tell you, when you least expect it, you do really, really well. And similarly, when you least expect it, you do really, really bad. <laughs> because mm-hmm. markets are not linear. Your equity curve, your equity curve at a distance looks linear. But when you look up close to the equity curve, all those bumps and curves, you know, you go up, you go ahead one pace, you go back two, you go up, you go ahead three paces, you come back one, you come back two. You know, you, you go ahead by five paces. No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So, you know, if you have, if you trade with a 0% risk of ruin, you will always know that you won't go bust. It doesn't mean that you won't avoid drawdowns. I mean, I had a terrible year in 2014 because all my models just had like a synchronized drawdown. And, but, you know, I didn't go broke because I traded with a 0% risk of ruin. You know, I had a losing year, made no, no money for that year. But you know what? The, the drawdown was you know, relatively mild because you know, I traded with a 0% risk of ruin. I, I traded very, very small relative to my risk capital. And that allows me to still be trading when the models kick in. And bang, they kicked off in 15 and 16. So, you know, nothing's linear. You know, everyone loses. The trick is to be the best loser so that you know, when your models are in sync with the market, you are still there to catch those nice trades because they will make up for the losses. Mm-hmm. And what would you tell people who are looking for exponential return and a lot of money from trading? Oh, I can understand that because, as I said, that's how we, we, we got attracted to this, this thing that we do is because money, you know, uh, financial independence, being our, our own boss, being the master of our own destiny. But unfortunately, when we come to markets, unfortunately, we're, we're what I call, we're, we are emotionally disorientated. Because we come to trading to make a lot of money, say we want to make 100% of our money. Unfortunately, there's no avoiding the old economics 101, you know, risk return trade off. That, you know, the more risk you take, sure, you can make more return. But, you know, risk has a bite to it that, you know, some years maybe you can make 100%. But I tell you, to be making 100% means you are taking on a fair amount of risk and it will catch up to you. And so, you know, I encourage people, and I talk about this in the book, that you need to turn your expectations upside down and not acknowledge the reason why you came into trading was to make a lot of money, but also acknowledge that it's probably, you know, keeping that idea in your head to make a lot of money is probably going to be, you know, the shortcut, you know, to the poor house. Because if you want to make a lot of money, you basically got to take on too much risk will eventually catch up to you and you'll go go broke. And essentially, your risk of ruin, if you're risking a lot of your risk capital on your trading, then your risk of ruin will be above 0%. So you're guaranteed to go bust. So you're going to go bust. There's no no doubt about that. So people have to change their orientation, their emotional orientation upside down. And what I do is, you know, my objective in trading, you know, I tell myself my, my objective in trading is not to be right or wrong. I don't care about whether I'm right or wrong because, you know, I'm, I'm wrong over half, 50% of the time. But what I do care about is that I want to manage my risk capital with a modest expectation. And I'm happy to make a 20 or 30% return per year because that's achievable without taking unnecessary risk. So I'd say to people who are coming into trading to make a lot of money, I'd say, I understand that. We, you know, we're all guilty of that. We've all done that. That's why we're here. But if you want to have a long-term, sustainable career in training, you will realize that to make a lot of money means you need to take risk, which would imply if you calculate your risk of ruin, it will be above 0%, which means that you, you are guaranteed that you will go bust. Nobody wants to have a guarantee of going broke. So pair it back, change your objectives from making a lot of money to managing your risk capital with a modest expectation. And work out what that expectation is. Is it 20%, 30%, 40%? Please make it reasonably modest. Once you have that number in your head, view yourself 12 months ahead. View yourself sitting down at your desk in December 2017 and think of yourself, how good it would it be to look at your trading account to see that your account's up by 30%? Hmm. And just, just visualize how good that feels. And visualize that during the calendar year of 2017, that you didn't take unnecessary risks. You traded with a 0% risk of ruin and you still managed to make a 30% return. And just visualize how good that would feel that if you're in that position. I remember how good that feels and that's what you should take with you as you go into the new year. But I think one of the problems is that 
alert traders think they have to make a huge percentage return in order to live from trading, while they don't necessarily have to. Oh, that, that's right. Like uh, people come to me saying, I got $10,000 and I want to make, you know, $30,000. You know, I'm going, what? 300%? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who makes 300%? I tell them that I'm not for them. I'm not for them. You know, I may give them a, you know, a, a strategy or an idea that, you know, for a particular time of the year has two or three trades in a row and bang, you know, and it does that. But that is just complete fluke. Where I can help people and, and I want to encourage people is that if you have a modest expectation, it is very possible. And so the idea is that, you know, we're all going to live to 100 years old. Even if you only have $10,000 today, if you can make 20 or 30%, you know, over the next 10 years, that will compound. And before you know it, you will have a little annuity business that's making, you know, 15, 20, 20 to 30% per year with minimal risk. And that will build up and that will build up and that will build up. And eventually it will be, you know, produce enough income to allow you to, to, um, to live off it and still, still grow the capital. But in the beginning, possibly not. So you've got to be modest. You know, you, you don't, there's it's, it's no, it's no free lunches, okay? If you view the long game and realize we're all relatively young and we're all going to live probably to 100, be patient, you'll get there. And you may be able to leave something for your kids and say, you know, this is a little business I have. Ignore all the fancy indicators and fancy charting programs and, and marvelous, you know, clever books. Just this is some, some simple ideas. It's not perfect, but you know what? It's got an edge. It's got a positive expectancy. And if you're conservative and you combine that with good execution, 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 that over the long period, your equity curve will be upward trending. You know, be content with that. Absolutely. And you don't need to have the perfect system to make money or to live from trading as well. Like any yeah. average system is probably going to work too, right? Exactly. And, and there is no perfect system. Yeah, um, from the start. And, uh, if there is, I haven't found it. You know, every strategy has got drawdowns, but simplicity is the key. So don't, don't think that there's some magical key that's going to unlock, you know, enormous profits. You know, I, I certainly haven't you know, come across it. And um, even if we give, you know, th those people who seem to think there is a holy grail, if we give them the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what, hey, there probably is a holy grail out there, right? And, but you know what? It's probably unlikely that you and I will have the time or the resources to find it, okay? Even if we had the time and the resources to find the Holy Grail, right, we don't want that to distract us from making money today. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you know, you, you get, why not acknowledge the fact that there could be a Holy Grail, okay? Because we all like to think that there's you know, a simple way and, a, and a, a foolproof way of trading, even though I've never found it after being in the market for 30 years. Let's say it, there is such a system and it's somewhere around in this world somewhere. And you know what? And we may make it a personal crusade to go find it, right? That's fine. But also embrace reality and reality says you have school fees, you have mortgages, you have bills to pay. You've got to start making money today. So focus on the practical, do the practical stuff. And when you have time, Hey, why not go go off on your holy crusade to find the holy grail? You know what? It could well be out there, right? But don't let that stop you from focusing on the business of trading and being involved today because there are strategies out there that have an edge that you just need to execute, execute with sensible money management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're right. I don't think you can make money researching. That's the problem, right? You cannot research all day for strategies or anything and... Expect to make a living from trading. Yeah, yeah. You've got to basically you know, balance your time. And unfortunately, the sexy part for me anyway of um, trading is the research. <laughs> so yeah. I do find that very appealing. But, you know, I still have to collect my data every day. I have to manage my open positions every day. I've got to put new orders in every day. You know, I've got to debit my P&L every day. You know, there's, there is a thing called the business of trading. And, you know, you have, you have to do that. Otherwise, nothing comes in. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about that because I think you're trading only a few hours in the, well, like only in the morning and then you're leaving your desk doing something else, right? Well, well um, yes and no. What, what I do is I'm a mechanical trader and I trade short-term, medium-term, long-term models, portfolio of models uh, across a portfolio of 32 markets. And, you know, I actually clicked on my Asian data the night before and in the mornings in Sydney time, I collect the North American and, and European data. 
and I run my models. And basically, my models just tell me, you know, what to do to move stops, new orders, blah, blah, blah. Once I'm happy with all that, I'll email all my orders to my broker. And after I've emailed my, my orders, I'll then send a final email that says, you know, you know, dear Simon, you know, have you received my 17 orders for today? Whatever it is, right? And as soon as he says, Brent, all received, bang. That allows me to, you know, well, that basically ends my my procedural procedural activities. You know what, what I actually do in terms of you know trading because I've got my data, I've run my models, I've checked you know where I am, what I have to do. I put my um, trade management in, orders in, my new orders in. I'm finished for the day. Does that make sense? Because my broker runs a 24 hour desk, so my broker manages all my trades and you know that does all the execution. So that frees me up to research. So. When I'm finished by nine o'clock, you know, I finished my part of trading because I basically passed it over to my broker mm-hmm. and he looks after that. I don't look at screens. I don't look at prices all day. I, I, you know, never, never, never do I look at prices. I spend, I spend all my time just, just researching ideas, you know, programming. Yeah. And this is one thing I do as well. I think looking at price all day is really counterproductive. So. It's not something I do yeah. on a daily basis, for sure. No, 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 no. It just sort of gets you excited, gets you depressed, you know. It's just a distraction. No, just follow your plan and, you know, place your orders and then stop looking at the screens and divert your time to something more productive like research. Yeah. And I think also being too involved in training is kind of a way to feel drained and tired at the, at the end of the day too, right? Is this something you've noticed as well? No, I'm not really that tired because... um. You know, because so, I'm so automatic in everything I do. I'm, yeah, I'm a exactly. mechanical trader. Being a mechanical trader takes takes less emotional energy because you're not having to sort of you know double guess the market. You know, a, a discretionary trader. I imagine for a discretionary trader, it would be uh, emotionally exhausting because you have to watch the market or you know you put more investment, so to speak, into making your decisions. But being a mechanical trader, it's it's really it's you know it's the models that make the decisions and. You know, I'm fine. I'm just no problems at all. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you've automated everything. So that that's pretty good. It's all automatic. Yeah, that's probably easier for most people anyway to automate this. That, exactly. It, it takes the emotion out of it. Yeah. Awesome. So I had a question from a person in my audience, Ivan, and he was asking about what are some of the uh, common kind of uh, conventional wisdom in trading that you think are false or wrong. Oh, the big one is blaming psychology. That's a big one. Yeah, certainly in Australia, um, you know, with the educators here, there's a, there was yeah, a huge message to traders that if they weren't being successful, it wasn't because of the technical knowledge that the educator may have shared with them. The problem was the individual, that the individual, you know, could not follow the plan, you know, could not execute their strategy. And so, therefore, their problem, their handicap was in their head, you know, that psychology is the most important thing in trading. I just so totally disagree with that. And it's on the, you know, it's scandalous, scandalous. And, you know what, if, if I had limitless pockets, I'd, you know, calling all of these people frauds, probably be, I'd probably be sued for it. But, you know, I'd have huge deep pockets so I could, you know, fight my court battles because it's, it's a perfect excuse for vendors or educators to say, hey, it's not the content, not the ideas I'm sharing with you that's letting you down. It's you personally. It's what's between your ears. And a lot of people find it easy to accept that because we all suffer anxiety. We all you know, hesitate. We, maybe, we knew that was a signal according to the ideas and, you know, and we should have placed that trade. And, of course, the one time that we did hesitate, the system worked. It's just unfortunately that for all the other times we didn't hesitate, the system didn't work. But then when, they, when we get accused of you know, hesitating and not following our trade plan, we go, well, you're right. It is us. You know, we are at fault. So psychology is a great get-out-of-jail card for the educator. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and, and this is something yeah, about and, this as well. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it, it, it's, also, it's also a pretty good get out of jail card for you and I, the trader, because we can say that our decision to go down that path, to learn that methodology, to approach the market that way, is still 
valid because what let me down wasn't that methodology. Yeah, it was me because I hesitated. Does that make sense too? So it's sort of like it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful scapegoat for both the vendor, the educator, and for us, the trader, to say, oh, thank God, I haven't wasted all my money buying that program or I haven't wasted all my money attending that workshop because it's just me. You know, I'm, I'm weak will, you know. You know, I'm just, I, I'm too impulsive, you know. I'm, I'm too greedy. It's just me, 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 me. And so oh, you don't feel wrong about learning a, a methodology that if you actually validated it or tried to validate it, you know, you would have realized it's got a negative expectancy, right? But it still allows you to feel okay about yourself making that decision to, to learn that methodology because what's let you down is psychology. So the big, yeah, the, that's probably the largest single little, um, little bit. That's probably the single largest idea in trading. I think it, you know, it's a bad idea. So psychology is important. I'm not, not saying it's not important, but a lot of people place it above methodology and above money management. But in my mind, nah. Risk of ruin, number one. Risk of ruin, number one. You need a zero percent risk of ruin, okay? And that is a function of methodology and money management. And below that is psychology. So psychology is important. It's important to um, you know, glue everything together, but it's not number one. Mm -hmm. And tell me if I'm wrong, but what I feel is that a lot of people try to develop a good psychology without putting in the work to define their strategy or writing their things down or planning their trades, all that stuff. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I say you know, the truth about trading, it's not about picking tops, picking bottoms, about finding that perfect entry technique or you know, that magic indicator. The truth about trading is understanding the math and then being the best loser, right? Because the best loser is a long-term winner. And it's all about the math. Once people understand the math, then they suddenly realize they've got to validate the way they're trading. They have to. And, and even if people are discretionary traders, you probably have heard of, I, I talk about being mechanical, systematic, right? Mm -hmm. And I've also mentioned this idea about discretionary trading. And I'm sure you, everybody who listens to your podcasts understands the t two distinctions or they've heard people being called mechanical traders and people being called discretionary traders, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, in one respect, that they are unnecessary labels, mechanical, discretionary They're just convenient labels. At the end of the day, you should pull both those labels off and all you have left is trader, okay? In my mind, the distinct distinction between what someone, somebody who's called a mechanical trader and the distinction with somebody who's called a discretionary trader is the mechanical trader actually knows what they're doing. They actually know how they wish to approach the market. They know what setups are looking for. They know where their entry level is. They know where their stop levels are, where they get out, right? Mm -hmm. A discretionary trader is essentially a trader who is clueless. And I know this is cruel. Uh, you'll have a lot <laughs> yes, of uh, complaints. Yes, really you have a, you have a lot, you'll have a lot of complaints from people. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, to deliberately upset people, but discretionary traders are people who still – in my opinion, have not worked out exactly how they want to trade. Because they always want to re have that, that right of veto to say, will I trade or won't I, or won't I trade? You know? And they're, they're just looking for the perfect setup. Whatever, that, that may be perfect in their head, they're looking for it. And to me, they may have three quarters of their puzzle solved, but they still have a large part of how they wish to approach the market, you know, a mystery to them. And so these discretionary people, They may say, but I can't backtest how I trade because it's not mechanical. So how can I work out what my expectancy is? So therefore, I can't work out what my risk of ruin is. And I'll say, well, no, 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 no. If you can think it, you can write it down and you can go through your data set, your spreadsheets, your chart, bar, bar, bar if you want. And you should be able to work out where you would have entered and where you, where you wouldn't have entered. And every time you say that you wouldn't have taken that trade, you have to write down the reasons for it. That becomes part of your trade plan. And as soon as you write down the reason why you didn't go, didn't take that particular setup, you need to go back to the very beginning of your data set and go again, right? Looking for all the setups based on your discretionary trade plan with your little extra condition about why you didn't take one of those trades. And if you come to a spot and you go, oh, I wouldn't have taken that trade, you write down that rule why you didn't take that trade. Mm -hmm. And you go back to the beginning of the data set and you look for all your setups based on your discretionary trade plan and those two discretionary interventions on why you didn't take two trades, right? 
So any it's kind of for- getting a discussion generator organized, is that right? Getting them organized, adding to the rules, adding to the rules. And then what you'll find is that they'll repeat that process 10 or 15 times because they'll be seeing coming up on their chart one of their setups with a huge loss. And they're going to be say, oh, you know what? I wouldn't have taken that trade because it's a Friday. Fridays are bad for trading. I'm not going to trade on Friday. That's okay. Write that down. Don't trade on Friday. Go back to the beginning. You know, look for all your setups based on your trade plans. And what you'll find is their trade plan will never be finished because they'll always find an excuse not to take a trade. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, the poor discretionary trader is just someone who may have most of the pieces of the puzzle together, but they're still missing some parts. Mm -hmm. While those people who are called mechanical traders, they're just traders who know what they're doing, Mm -hmm. right? They're just traders who know what they're doing. The traders who call themselves discretionary, those people are still looking for the complete way to trade. And, and really, they probably shouldn't be trading because and until you've worked out exactly how you're going to trade, how can you work out what your historical data set would look like? You trade so you can work out what your expectancy is and hence risk of ruin. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think discretionary trading kind of becomes an excuse for not making a plan and not preparing yourself to trade. That's right. And and these people need to be told about this this idea that anyone who trades has a statistical risk of ruining their account. It's called risk of ruin. Mm -hmm. And anything above 0% is a guarantee that you'll go bust. People with a higher percentage risk of ruin obviously will go broke faster than somebody with a lower percentage risk of ruin. The fact is, we all have a risk of ruin. Now, who goes into trading to ruin their account? No one. So those discretionary people should be told about this key idea about um, risk of ruin and say, guys, you shouldn't be trading until you know you're trading with a 0% risk of ruin. And to do that, you need to look at your methodology and you've got to make it really tight in terms of you've got to know all the rules. How many rules? You may have 20 rules. I don't know. Discretionary traders keep adding rules to how they trade. But you know what? It has to stop, stop at some stage. Then you go back and you go through your data set and you look at every trade that you would have taken, every profit and every loss you would have taken according to your rules, and then calculate what your expectancy is. And then from that, combine your money management and calculate your risk of ruin. If it's 0%, off you go. But if it's above 0%, you have no business trading. Don't trade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tough because people don't want to hear that. They want to trade as uh, soon as possible. Of course. And I understand that. But I just, I'm just trying to teach people that they just, you know, they're the, they are the walking dead. They are the walking dead, you know, and it's not fair on themselves. It's not fair on their families. You know, they're just going to become cannon fodder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Any other advice you'd like to give traders before we conclude the interview? Because we're already uh, 47 minutes in, so I want to strike your time. You know, the, the key thing to me is just understanding, you know, the universal truth about trading. And it's just about knowing the maths, number one, and number two, being the best loser. Being the best loser sounds like a cliche, but it's not. Being the best loser means that you'll be the long-term winner. And then number one, the maths is people have to get their head around this key concept of um, risk of ruin. Learn how to spell it, learn how to articulate it, understand the mathematics behind it, and calc- everyone should just not trade until they've calculated what their risk of ruin is and not trade unless it's at 0%. That's a key concept. My, that's my big takeaway to anyone is just we all have it and nobody trades to go broke. So therefore, how about calculate what your risk of ruin is and make sure it's at zero percent before you place your next trade. And when you calculate the risk of ruin, how do you know that you're not testing it in a place where the market was different than usual? Oh, when it comes down to methodology and your expectancy, really you want to ensure that your methodology is robust. Okay? That's what you're referring to as um we all want to have a robust methodology, and a robust methodology, you know, will have a continuing upward sloping equity curve under both bull market and bear market conditions. Mm-hmm. Will it be totally linear? No, it's not. Nothing is totally linear. But over the long term, a robust strategy will have an upward moving equity curve, and you will have periods of drawdown. And this is why you have to embrace this idea of risk of ruin, because by having, trading with a 0% risk of ruin, there's no guarantee that you'll make money. What it does is it 
will guarantee, if you do it properly, you won't go bust. So that you will come out the other end of a drawdown when your strategy is struggling, you'll come out of that because you, you're placing small bets, right, relative mm-hmm. to your risk capital. And so that um, when things turn up for your strategy, you'll be there placing your small trades, place a small trade, place a small trade, and bang, off you go, and you'll pull out of your um your drawdown. So, you know, in risk of ruin, the two pillars of risk of ruin is expectancy and money management. Expectancy is all about your methodology. You want a robust methodology, and robustness is a function of longevity, simplicity, and performance over a wide, diverse portfolio. Interesting. Pretty cool. How can people find you? Uh, I'll have a website called indextrader.com.au. Probably the best thing is if people want to learn, learn more about how I think about the market is, is don't worry about my website. Um, just get a copy of my book. It's called The Universal Principles of Successful Trading by John Wiley. You know, a lot of the stuff we discussed today is in the book. And um, yeah, it's probably the most important stuff that I know because the principles are far more important than the actual, you know, the day-to-day, you know, techniques that we use. Mm-hmm. And we'll make sure to put all the links in the show notes over at disartrade.com so people can find everything there. Uh, we put everything and people will be able to reach out to you and find your book. And I highly, highly recommend your book. It's been probably the one of the greatest books I've read in uh, like recently in a couple of past months. So I really, really recommend that book for sure. Mm, thank and you. Brent, what kind of goal do you have for the future? Oh, oh just my, my boys will grow up being respectful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just nothing changes. Just um, just doing what I'm doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we're in December 2016, so I have all my Christmas lights up. So that's good. Oh, Happy nice. about that. You know, you know. One thing I can share that next year that um decided I'm going to do a a follow up book to oh. the Universal Principles of Successful Trading, and the reason being is I get a lot of questions, a lot of emails about what examples can I give people about objective trading, and so yeah, I'm going to do a book. I'm going to be going to, uh, I think I'll be calling it Universal Tactics of Successful Trading, and it'll be a smaller book than this first one, this Universal Principles because I want it just to focus on our methodology. So the book would be seen as a companion book to, to the Universal Principles of Successful Trading. And it'll be, um, in that book, I don't, I don't talk about anything regarding entry techniques, exit techniques, setups. And so in this book, I will. Nice. And what's your main motivation to do all that, to write another, like a third book now? What's the main motivation? Ah. Uh, I get the same emails all the time, um, and um, I know I just feel I feel I want to do it. Um, when did this book come out? Well, it's been a few years now. Hang on, let me open it. When did this book come out? Ah, oh, two thousand and ten. Six years. Oh, okay. So next year be two thousand seventeen. So that'll be seven years. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a seven year itch. Oh, not, not sure. But but also um, I'm really hesitant. I've been asked to write other books, and I've always said no, no, no. And good authors out there that you know I, I admire, and and their first couple of initial books were brilliant, and then they sort of the other books just sort of fell away. And uh, I, I always said to myself, I didn't want to fall into that trap of just just writing context for, for the sake of writing context. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That I wanted one of my books to to, to be able to stand up and um, last the, the, the test of time. And so. I didn't want to do something just for the sake of oh, I'm Brent Penfold. You know, it's been three years. You know, I can't do a, do a follow up book. I want to do a book that I'm, you know, I think can still be valuable in in twenty years time. And um, I think that it'll be a smaller book than the Universal Principles. It's going to be like maybe you know just it'll be the companion manual or the the addition to that book to say okay we're talking about the principles. Okay, let's now look at some examples and. Um, to help give people a heads up on uh, how to progress forward. And, yeah, I think that would complement the book. I know what I'm going to write and it's going to be good. And, um, yeah, hopefully I'll be seen as an author who just doesn't write books to um, fill up their bookshelf. But Mm -hmm. who wants to write a book that's going to, you know, contribute to people. Nice. Um, And that's going to be probably a book I'll be looking forward to read for sure. And Brent, we yeah. have a question we always ask the guests at the end of the podcast. And this is going to be really similar to your last chapter. 
But if you could give only one piece of advice for traders, what would that one sentence of advice be? Well, one piece of advice would be is to understand risk of ruin, know what your risk of ruin is, and once it's at 0%, attempt to become the best loser that you can be because that's the only real secret to trading is that the best loser is the long-term winner, full stop. Love that. Really consistent. Brent Pinfold, thanks so much for being in the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you for having me on. So there you have it. Brent Penfold was such a nice guest, and I learned so much just from this interview. So I recommend you guys take one thing that you'll apply, and definitely check out Brent's book. If you want to connect with me after the show, check out the Facebook group at desartedway.com forward slash group, and I'll make sure to do my best to help you out. If you're really committed about succeeding in trading, and if you're serious about getting results, check out the Desire to Trade Academy. This is the academy where I'm able to help traders and make the biggest impact on traders, whatever level they're at. If you're not profitable, or if you're still breaking even in trading, there's something you can do, and I'm ready to help you out. So check this out. Simply go on desire2trade.com and click the tab where it's written Academy. You'll see everything there. And if you need to talk, just let me know, and I'll be happy to help you out. So on that note, I'll see you in the next episode of the Desire to Trade podcast. Ciao. Thanks for listening to the Desire to Trade podcast. To get all the information on this show, free articles, and unique resources, make sure to check out www.desiretotrade.com and subscribe. Please leave us a review and let us know what you thought about the show. It's time to become the best trader you can be. See you next time.